All right, welcome back to Core Ultrasound Image Review number 10. We're going to continue on with Jacob's lecture that he gave to the emergency medicine residents of the University of Kentucky. We've got a cool mix of different images to look at. We're going to look at things like a serratus anterior block, a median nerve block, how to really nail those small joint taps. And we're going to wrap up with the evaluation of the right heart. We're going to dive into the McConnell sign and differentiating acute from chronic right heart strain. Let's get into it. This, I'm so excited. I just like found this on QA and I looked at who it was and very excited that this was done. This right here is a needle, a great view of the needle in the long axis. And this right here is the median nerve. We have the superficial flexors up here. We have the deep flexors down here is they're infiltrating the area right above that nerve. And then they're backing up and going beneath the nerve to create a little kind of donut of anesthetic. So anesthetic and then the donut hole would be this nerve. It's so good. It made me so happy. And they said the block worked very well. And here you can see that they're infiltrating the area around. So um, here at the end here, ooh, let's pause it and go all the way to the end here. We see a donut around this nerve. Remember, you don't want to get inside the nerve. You want to get in the fascial plane below and above that nerve um, to surround it. Quick review on median nerve blocks. The median nerve uh, supplies the sensory innervation um, for all of this area. So it's a pretty powerful block. Most of the times when I'm doing hand blocks, I'm doing them for the uh, using the ulnar nerve block or the median nerve block because the radial is just like a small part of the sensory uh, innervation of the hand. So if you're going to learn two nerve blocks, learn the median learn the radial. These are a couple of indications. This is not uh, the patient uh, that this particular block was used for. But over here, we have an abscess in the thenar eminence. You can see um, pus training already. And here's a laceration on the thenar, thenar eminence that I have used median nerve blocks in the past. The pro placement is going to be probably mid arm would be the best place to place it. You have these superficial and these deep branches of the median nerve, and they branch off at a variable distance from uh, the wrist. So if you go up on the form, you're definitely going to capture the nerve before it splits A and B. As you get closer to the hand, it hurts a little bit more. You have more pain receptors closer to the hand. So hurts a little bit less, more likely to get a complete block. Here is uh, the technique. Um, I tell some of you guys this, but um, when I was a fellow, I really wanted to like understand these nerve blocks better because I think they're so important. And so I had my fellowship director, uh, Matt Dawson, do basically every single block on me. And here is a median nerve block. Um, be really careful over here with this BD boy right there. That is uh, my radial artery. You definitely, if you're coming at it from a in-plane approach, definitely be able to identify this and make sure that you're going underneath it. All right. So here is his needle placement. Um, and I'll go to the next image right here. And you'll see that needle come in. It's obviously I wasn't, my heart rate wasn't like 200. I sped it up obviously. And here you can see the needle coming in. And here is that nerve. And he's going to start injecting right underneath it right here to create anesthetic within that, um, within that fascial plane. Now, what I usually do instead of doing this in the long axis is I will do this in the short axis. It's one of two nerve blocks that I do in the short axis. The reason why I do it in the short axis is because when you come at it laterally, you're actually going through a lot more tissue. And I will tell you, when I got this block done to me, you see this guy right here? This is a tendon. And when Matt went through that tendon, that was the part. See right here, you can see it kind of like stretching a little bit right there. And then he'll pop past it. Wait for it. Right there, he pops past it. I will tell you that out of all of the blocks he did, this is the one that hurt the most because of him going through a tendon, which was tricky. Um, what I prefer to do is actually a short axis technique. So here is the median nerve. I come at it basically like I'm doing an ultrasound guided IV and I'll track it down right here. And here you can see my needle right next to it. I'm in, I'm doing some hydro dissection to get that fluid around that median nerve. So that nice little donut around that median nerve. This one right here, I'm so excited about this one because this is one that is one of my favorite blocks to do. So excited about this block. It's very helpful for uh, rib fractures and axillary abscesses, uh, which are two things that are very difficult to pain control. So you guys see right here, uh, the needle, it's a little out of plane for a second, but we find it 
you see this anesthetic right here. Here's the needle tip. See that anesthetic right there? This is a plane block. I will tell you that this right here is a rib, and you can see the pleura down here. Does anyone have any idea what this block is called? I'm going to assume that everybody knows. It's called a serratus anterior block. This right here is the serratus. And what you're trying to do is you're trying to inject anesthetic in the plane above or below, but I usually do above, of the serratus anterior. And it blocks the entire, um, mostly the lateral, but a little bit the anterior um, chest wall. Great for rib fractures. And it does the axilla as well. Um, so this uh, is uh, an example of where to go. You can actually see um, on this uh, individual here, um, you can see uh, the serratus muscle here, here, and here. Your place that you're going to inject is about the mid axillary line at like the T5-ish level, which ends up being right around where the nipple is, maybe right a little bit lower to where the nipple is. That's what your injection is. The exact site doesn't matter all that much. If you're like, you know, maybe you're T6 instead of T5, that doesn't matter because you're doing a relatively large volume block in a plane area. So it's not like a specific area. You're going to just like infiltrate anesthetic everywhere. Uh, you can, if your patient's in a lot of pain, you can have them laying on their back. Um, that can work, but best case scenario, you're having them lay on their side and this is how you're doing your uh, needle placement for that serratus block. And here's another example of a serratus block. Um, this right here is a serratus muscle. It's basically the muscle that's on top of the ribs. It's right there, highlight, highlight, highlighted in red. And you advance that needle until you get to the fascial plane that is in uh, right on top of the serratus. It's interesting because they've done studies of above or deep to the serratus and they both do pretty much the same. So it's probably safer to just stay above. So I have this needle here and now I'm injecting fluid in the fascial plane in between the serratus and um, the muscle above it. Now, one thing uh, that you should do, notice, let's back it up just a little bit right here. Notice my path. So this is assuming that my patient does not already have a pneumothorax. So if they already have a pneumothorax, it doesn't really matter all that much. But if all they have is broken ribs or you're doing this for abscess, right here is a rib. And notice my path is going directly towards that rib. So if the patient coughs or jumps or I slip and the needle goes a little bit too far, I'm going to poke the rib. I'm not going to poke the pleura. And that's actually like super important. You want to create a neatrogenic pneumothorax. Don't create neatrogenic pneumothorax. Next ultrasound image. Again, super, I'm, you know, you guys know how I am. I'm so excited about ultrasound. What this is, is this is an ankle effusion tap. So right here is probably the tibia and right here is probably the talus right here. And this is an ankle effusion. And here is that needle going right into that ankle effusion. We can do taps, you guys. We can do hip taps. We can do knees. We can do ankles. We can do these. I would suggest doing these all with ultrasound because it is significantly more accurate. And it's just like with ultra, with ultrasound guided IVs versus landmarks. With ultrasound guided IVs, you're like digging around sometimes, which hurts more. Whereas with an ultrasound guided IV, you know exactly the path. It's like a straight line down. It's the same thing with these, arthro, with these arthrocentesis. You're not like poking around like you do for like an LP trying to find the spot. With the ultrasound, you can directly visualize that fluid and make sure that that needle goes directly inside that fluid. Here's an example of doing one on a patient with a probe placement. I, when I'm doing these, I generally am full sterile uh, because I don't want to accidentally introduce stuff um, into the joint space. And by full sterile, I'm not like in a gown and a uh, bouffant cap or whatever, but I'm using the sterile gloves and I'm using the uh, transducer sheath cover as well. This is that same image that we saw before. Um, here is um, the uh, tibia and this is the talus right here. And you can see that it's very easy to get visualization of that actually relatively small effusion, uh, at least a tap with that ultrasound. So I'm poking right there, increasing my angle and you'll be able to see over here, um, the needle come into view. So I'm a little off axis right here, but I move my transducer a little bit and you can see right here, I'm gonna poke into that space and be able to drain some pretty gross fluid in there. 
Um, this right here, pretty sweet. What do you guys think? Oh, oh my goodness. Um, quick question, you guys. Would I measure, if I was measuring this massive aorta, would I measure from here to here? We will measure from here to like out here somewhere. We've got to measure outer wall to outer wall. This is a massive aorta. Yes, good job, Wes. It's a McConnell sign. Right side of the heart over here. That heart is popping. Right heart strain. Yeah, Robin, you're totally right. This is the right heart over here. This is the left heart. This is acute right heart strain. You see this right here? You see how this apex is hyperkinetic relative to out here? This is called the McConnell sign, and this is indicative of acute right heart strain. Notice I didn't say this is indicative of a PE. I said this is indicative of acute right heart strain. The reason for that is that if you have, you take all echoes that are ever done in a hospital, McConnell sign is actually not specific for a PE. Because it happens in RVMIs, it happens when you have acute uh, core, pulmon uh, core pulmonale as well, it can cause it. Um, however, if you have a patient in whom you suspect they have a PE, and you look for a McConnell sign, the McConnell sign in that situation is specific. It's all about how you apply the test. And then I wanted to show you another clip over here. This is chronic RV enlargement. You see here that the wall of the RV is really thick. This right atrium is huge. I'm not seeing any McConnell sign. This is chronic right heart enlargement. If you can, what you can do, there's a bunch of things you can do to differentiate from chronic and acute right heart strain, but the easiest is probably going to be looking at the thickness of the RV wall. If the thickness of the RV wall is greater than 0.5 centimeters, it's more likely to be chronic enlargement. So with ultrasound guided IVs, make sure that you choose the vein correctly. I usually start in the form just to save the upper arms. With nerve blocks, I usually do them in plane, although with the median nerve block, I'll sometimes do it out of plane. With serratus blocks, make sure that your needle trajectory is going directly towards a rib, especially if your patient doesn't have a pneumothorax because you don't want to be the cause of miniatrogenic pneumothorax. For a AAA, make sure that you measure outer wall to outer wall, not inner lumen to inner lumen. And with joint aspirations, it's pretty easy. Just go for the biggest pocket there to make sure that you are the most successful. Hope to hear from you soon and happy scanning.